the story of the San Francisco Giants is legendary. In my years as the official voice of the Giants, I've had the privilege to meet countless players and personalities whose passion for this team is only matched by their love for the game. Their stories are intertwined within the fabric of this team's history. They are forever Giants. And the pitch to Oster is swung on and this struck him out. Foul tip and held by Terry Kennedy. Strike three. Dave Dravecki's story is one that motivates and inspires people around the world. It's a story of a man who chased his dream until it became a reality. Never the standout, Dave worked harder than most to become a professional baseball player. During his career, he would face challenges even bigger than baseball, not by choice, but by chance. Dave's story is one of overcoming adversity time and time again. It's a story that he has told thousands of times as a motivational speaker, and it's a story that begins in Youngstown, Ohio. Well, let's start at the beginning, because your, your story is so remarkable, and you started playing baseball as a child in Ohio. Yeah. yeah. Eight years old, I think you started, but you played all kinds of sports, you and your brothers, you said. Yeah, we, um, you know what, we were a very active family. I had uh, four brothers at the time. God bless your mother. Um, oh my gosh, uh, yes, we don't even want to get into that because <laughs> I can tell you some amazing stories, but they were so supportive of us. You know, when we were growing up as kids, um, we were extremely active. When you've got all, all boys in the household, um, you know, it's one thing after the other. And baseball was something that was just huge for all of us. And so we started with that love and my dad was our coach. And you know, what's really cool, I look back on that time in my life and you know, one of the things I appreciate so much about my parents was that they were my cheerleaders. Yeah. Um, and, and they didn't try to live their dream through me. Um, they really encouraged me to pursue whatever it was I wanted to do. And my dad said, Dave, whatever it is that you choose to do, um, work as hard as you can to be the best you can. But he said, you know, more important than that, have fun doing whatever it is, because life is too short not to enjoy whatever it is you pursue doing. And, and that stuck with me throughout my life. And my dad's still alive at 87. And, and um, I'm just so grateful when we're together, I'm always reminded of those words that came from his mouth when I was a little kid. You both your mom, you say she was your greatest cheerleader. Your dad was, you say, your biggest influence in you becoming a baseball player. They really instilled in you uh, some important values that really served you well throughout what has been a really remarkable journey for you. Yeah, it, it has been absolutely amazing. Um, you know, when you've got your dad there every day, when you're playing this wonderful game, and he's giving you everything that he can, you know, one of the things that was so special, you know, I'd, I'd, I'd want to play catch, you know, and so I'd sit in the driveway waiting for my dad, would come home about five o'clock. He worked in a machine shop, and he was dirty. Every day he came home, he was greasy, he was cut up by the steel, the, you know, the shavings from the steel, and, and he'd, he'd drive around the corner, and I'd be standing there tossing the ball up in the air, playing catch with myself until he got home so I could play catch with him. And I'll never forget, I would look at him and he'd come around the corner and he'd see me in the drive. And all of a sudden his eyeballs would just go, oh no, here we go again. <laughs> and he would pull in and he was so gracious. He'd get out of the car and he'd say, give me 15 minutes and meet me in the backyard. Uh -oh. And that's where my dad taught me. He was the first one to teach me how to actually throw a baseball with control and, and to have fun doing it. And so he instilled that love of the game. You know, that's why the movie for love of the game, I love so much, Field of Dreams. All those things remind me of this wonderful relationship with my father um, that instilled in me that love for the game that I got the unique privilege of playing at the highest level. Dave Dravecki's childhood dream of becoming a professional baseball player would begin to take shape when he walked on to play baseball at Youngstown State. A no-hitter in his first start was the catalyst of change in his four-year collegiate career, where he set or tied six pitching records. Dave was drafted by the Pittsburgh Pirates in 1978, but he wouldn't make his big league debut until 1982, after he was traded to the San Diego Padres. 
two years later, Dave was pitching in the 1983 MLB All-Star Game. Well, let's move on through through your time with the Padres and uh, some of your teammates. And actually, you and uh, Bruce Bochy were teammates. Yes, we in were. San Diego. Talk a little bit about that. Yeah, Buckethead caught me. Buckethead. Yeah. That's fantastic. <laughs> Well, everybody knows about the size of his head. And back when we played, he was Buckethead. <clears throat> I remember in spring training, we roomed in uh, uh, Palm Springs uh, for a couple of days. And, man, all he would play was uh, Sweet Home Alabama over and over and over again. And I was like, Bruce, come up with some different music, man. Yeah. And I wasn't a big music fan, so I didn't lose any sleep over that. Right. But we had a great time. And I always thought, you know, he's just really quiet. He's just a really quiet guy. And, uh, and yet, he was really cerebral, very smart, behind the dish, called a really good game. He didn't catch me very often. As he says, TK was the starter, Terry Kennedy. Mm -hmm. And so on Sundays, he would, you know, he would uh, fill in. And so anyway, uh, just have a, had a wonderful, wonderful time with, with Boach. So good times in San Diego, and you are thinking that you and Jan are going to settle after your playing days are over. You're going to be a part of the San Diego community. You're thinking about your career after baseball, being in San Diego. Sure. And here we come, July 4th, 1987, and you get traded to the San Francisco Giants, you and Craig Lefferts and, and Kevin Mitchell. Kevin Mitchell. All right. Yeah, incredible. Um, you know, uh, another one of those moments where you're traded, which means they don't want you. And so it was, it was really bitter when we walked into Larry Boa's office after b playing a game in Montreal. And, and Larry said, Dave, um, go get uh, Kevin and, and, and Lefty, and, and I want to see you guys. And so I did, and we walked into his office and sat down, and he looked at us, and he said, guys, I'm just going to cut right to the chase. We've traded you to the San Francisco Giants. And, and we were all shocked. Mm -hmm. The three of us just sat there, and we didn't know what to do. Wow. And, and Kevin was really upset. Was he? Because he was born and raised in San Diego. Exactly. And he was so upset that he didn't want to go. Yeah, I'm sure he thought he would end his career yeah. there, too. It was yeah. amazing. And so it took everything for Craig Lefferts and I to convince Kevin to get in the cab with us oh. to go to the airport the next morning because yeah. he did not. he was ready to go home. And so we literally had to persuade him to get to the airport with us and fly to Chicago to join the club in Chicago. How'd you finally end up convincing him? Um, we, we, I think it was a matter of just words that we hoped would be an encouragement to him to realize that even though we're not wanted here, somebody else wants us. Yeah. And, and the other thing was just praying a lot that he would actually hear it and get in the <laughs> car with us. It was like, because it was Boogie Bear. Yeah. And you didn't want to mess with Kevin Mitchell, man. Absolutely not. He was one tough hombre. That's and right. So we were very, right. very gracious and yet tried to be as firm as we could that we have no choice. We've got to go. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And Mitch, you can play. You can't walk away from this. Yeah. And so we get there in Chicago and somebody comes up to us um, in the clubhouse. and uh, Wasn't it Murph? Was it Mike I think it Murphy? might have been Murph. I think it was Mike Murphy. It was Murph, yeah. But even before that, okay. before that, Mike Kruko saw us come in. Oh. And I think he was the first guy, if I recall, who said, gentlemen, welcome to San Francisco, and we are so glad to have you with us. You are the final pieces of the puzzle. We had no clue what he was talking about. <laughs> Murph says, hey, Roger Craig wants to see you. Oh, okay. Now what do you You need thinking? to go to his. You, we, now I'm thinking, oh, my gosh. Okay. Yeah. I don't, we have no idea what he's going to say. Right. We walk into the office and there's Norm Sherry, Al Rosen, and Hum Baby. Wow. We sit down and Al Rosen looks at us and says, gentlemen, welcome to the San Francisco Giants. And then Roger Craig says, and we want you to know, you are the final pieces to the puzzle that we have been building. And we are now ready to take this thing by storm. All right, well, let's talk about it. Yeah. Let's talk about it. Um, 1988, opening day. Yeah. You're, you're, on, you're on top of the world. You're 32 years old. You're a San Francisco giant. You're the opening day starter. Yeah. You've got a beautiful wife and, and family. You are on top of the world. You are living the dream. Yeah. Tell me about that opening day start. It was amazing. You know, you can't paint a better picture. You got Chavez Ravine, Dodger Stadium. 
Dave Dravecki versus Fernando Valenzuela. Come on. I mean, it was amazing that Classic. day. Yeah. yeah, and we won five to one that day. I hit a double off of Fernando. He threw me that lazy screwball and he hung it up and it went off of the right center field wall. And I mean, I was so fired up and we win. And I'm thinking, man, I'm going to win 20 games. Yes. And all of a sudden by September, I'm notice, noticing this lump on the outside of my left arm. So you discovered it. Yeah. Um, and it was it was obvious by this time. It had grown to about half the size of a golf ball that was sticking out of my arm. Oh, my goodness. So Jan and I um, were in an examining room waiting for the doctors to come back to tell us what they see on the MRI that I just had. Before they get into the room, and our door was open a few inches, um, they put the films underneath the lights, and they examined it first to confirm just to be on the same page as to what they were going to tell us. And I'll never forget hearing the word cancer. And I heard the doctor say, outside of a miracle, you'll never pitch again. Mm. And Jan asked them to say it two more times. Oh, did she? Yes, she did. It was almost like a test. Are you sure? Right. Outside of a miracle, he'll never pitch again. Like, you don't know my husband. Um, but when I heard those words, I thought to myself, well, you know what, God? Uh, the doctors can tell me that, but I don't know what the end result's going to be. So, you know, I want to focus on my health. That's very important. But if I get to a point where I can actually start trying to come back, I am going to try because I don't want to walk away from this game and wonder for the rest of my life. What if? Yeah. Could I have been able to do the comeback? Right. I didn't. That's not Dave Dravecki. Right. I don't live my life that way. So we're going for this. Ten months after that, on August 10th, 1989, I am getting ready to stand on the mound in Candlestick Park. And when the doctor said outside of a miracle, you will never pitch again. I was going to pitch. There you were. I remember walking out onto the field and standing on the mound, and all of a sudden, 34,000 people gave me a standing ovation. And I look behind me, and I see, welcome back, Dave. And I was like, oh, my gosh, God. You've given me a second chance. My dreams not only come true once, but twice. You I'm were able to take in. all that in in that moment. In you that were able moment. to be present in all of that in that yes. moment. That's amazing. It was amazing. And, and the first thing I said was, thank you. Thank you. And I was overwhelmed by that. All of a sudden, the umpire said, play ball. And all I was thinking was, I need to throw a ball so they can get the ball. And <laughs> take it out of the game. <laughs> Nobody thought I should pitch. Right, right. And I'm sitting, I'm standing there on the mound, and I'm going, how can I get the ball? Oh. So the first pitch was a ball. I do remember that yeah, pitch. Yeah. And yeah. the first pitch was a ball. And then from there... I threw 92 pitches, eight innings, yeah. and we defeat the Cincinnati Reds 4-3. to three. I mean, you can't even script this, Dave Dravecki. No. You cannot have scripted that any better. You know, and five days later, mm. you know, I mean, after this incredible game, I'm in the sixth inning against the Montreal Expos, and I rear back and throw the fastball. Dravecki is hurt badly. People have said was the crack hurt around the world. Well, let's talk a little bit about um, overcoming the adversity of that journey, yeah. um, going through cancer twice and having to battle it twice. And I know you've been very open about how difficult it was for you, that you were depressed and you yeah. were, you know, you had a lot of anger issues. And can you share that, as you've shared with so many, which helped so many people around the world overcome their own adversity. So talk about that part of your journey. Yeah, that was an extremely difficult time in life. You know, um, uh, we were really at a, at a dark place. Um, we were... Both you and Jan. Both Jan and I. And, and, and for Jan, um, it was much deeper because she was trying to now, after I had to announce my retirement from the game and the cancer came back and we went through the process of all the surgeries, um, trying to be everything to everybody. And so a bunch of people stepped in to help. The mm -hmm. Giants, um, an organization um, called Insight for Living, that um, handled all the serious suicidal counseling letters mm. that we received because people were just pouring out their hearts. It was overwhelming. And then publishers wanted us to write our story and we're in the midst of this and it's just coming at us and coming at us and coming at us. And so much of it was good, but we were, I was just not ready to handle that. You couldn't even catch your breath. Physically, yeah. yes. Yeah. And Jan was trying to be everything to everybody. And so it all kind of culminated with this amputation and I thought if we could get rid of my arm, we could get rid of all my problems. Mm, the arm that gave you your career. The greatest and joy. your life. Yeah. Was now gone. And I thought, but if we can get rid of this, 
Maybe I can get rid of all my problems. Mm. And that's when the, the darkest of the darkness began because I went into an identity crisis. Who am I if I can no longer be a pitcher? What am I going to do as an amputee? Who's going to want me to be able to um, work, to provide a living? I didn't make the kind of money that warranted us being able to w- retire and walk off into the sunset after this. So I had to work mm. to provide a living for our family. And so as a result of that, it became extremely difficult. And and I had stuffed a lot, Rennell. Mm-hmm. And, and I didn't know how to articulate that. Right. And so as a man, I realized that if I showed any weakness then I was done. And so I had to be strong. And, and I actually found out that strength is really in weakness. And, um, but in order to get there, um, I had to get worse because I became verbally abusive to the people that I love the most. Um, you didn't know what to do with your emotions. I didn't know how to communicate what yeah. was going on. I didn't know how to articulate my pain. Jan was really good at that. I was horrible. And unfortunately, the people I love the most, I was the hardest on. Of course. And, you know, I don't say this as an excuse, but for me, they were safe. I understand. And yet at the same time, that is no reason to ever treat a woman like that, to ever treat two little kids like that. It was horrible. But it wasn't even really you. You know what I mean? Yes. It wasn't you. Yes, because... It, it, it was the result of all this pain that I stuffed because I didn't know how to talk about that pain. And in the talking is the healing. And so um, eventually we finally moved to a place where I was willing to say to Jan, um, if you're struggling that much, I was still in denial, Renault. Right mm-hmm. If you're struggling that much, then I will support you and we'll go get counseling. Mm. And we moved into 18 months of counseling. We both got on Prozac. We call it vitamin P. Okay. And so it was an incredible tool in helping us to heal along with going into our story and finding those places that needed to be reworked Mm -hmm. because they were very unhealthy. For 18 months, the gift that God gave me was to actually learn how to communicate to the most amazing woman in my life. That's one of the bravest things you can do is, is, is go to therapy oh. and figure it out. And what I experienced, when people say and talk about God's grace, I actually experienced it firsthand through an amazing woman named Jan Drabecki. That you did. And so as a result of that, when we were done with the counseling, we had moved to Colorado to get a fresh start. And while we were there, she had received a book that she was asked to endorse dealing with men and their anger. How ironic (laughs) is that? Yes. And as a result of that, (laughs) Rennell, she came to me and said, I would like for you to go to this counselor who specializes in anger. Mm. Are you willing to do that? And I was so healthy at that point. I said, honey, Absolutely, I do not want to be this man anymore. You had done the work, so you were, you were able to receive that from her. Absolutely. Yeah. And so she gave me that gift, another gift. Yeah. And for 12 months, I went into anger management counseling. And it really wasn't anger management. It was freedom from anger. Mm-hmm. It was freedom from anger because I, I think my wife would tell you today, it's been about 22 years since Mount Vesuvius erupted. Mm. And gosh, that feels good to say. Yeah. It really does. Yeah. And so, you know, we, we got on a healthy track and it was so good. Talk about you as a motivational speaker and an author now and how, how you two work that into your lives. Yeah, you know, it's been amazing. When, when those people started writing to us, Little would we know that that really was the birthing of what would become Endurance with Jan and Dave Dravecki. And what we have been able to do for 28 years is to just simply through our story, come alongside people and love them in the midst of their pain. And and we do that by offering uh, what we call our encouragement gift box (laughs) that basically has our story in it, um, book form. And we send those off with a couple of mugs that have Endurance on it to remind them to endure the journey and that somebody else out there loves them even though they don't know them. 
um, speaking, my gosh, girl, <laughs> I'd have told you after five years of doing that that nobody else would want to hear my story anymore. Are you kidding me? Please. And here I am, 28 years. I might My years might be messed up, and Jan obviously <laughs> reminds me that my details aren't very good. That's all right. But somewhere in that neighborhood, yeah. I have been telling the same story. And, and it has been an incredible gift to me and Jan to be able to do that, to think that I'm just one person in this universe of some pretty amazing people with amazing stories. And I get the privilege of telling that story yeah. over and over and over again. That's why my message is don't ever deny the significance of your story, whether it's in front of 5,000 people or five people or just one. That story is powerful. So to you and to all the people that are a part of this, and anyone that listens to this, the San Francisco Giants are the most amazing organization in the world because I get to love on people like you oh. and all the people that I meet through that organization oh. and be loved by you. Oh. And that gift, we will never forget, never. Because I hope the fans in this community realize, I think they do, just how special the orange and black are. Oh, they, they most certainly do, and they yeah. so understand. I hope you feel it whenever oh. you're around us, oh. how much you mean to us and to the organization. How about that? When I go to the ballpark, <laughs> when I go into San Francisco, and all of a sudden I'm walking on the sidewalks and I hear, Dravecki! <laughs> I'm like, oh my gosh, man, when I lived in Colorado, nobody said Dravecki. was like, buddy, get out of the way! You know, so here I am in this incredible place where... I will tell you, I'll be the honest retired guy who says it's wonderful to be remembered. There it is. It's wonderful to be remembered, but it is amazing to be a giant. Well, I hope you feel the love from the fans when you come to the ballpark. And thank you and Jan for being a gift to us. And thank you for this conversation today. It has been the, the thrill of, of my life, really, to be able to talk to you about <laughs> your amazing journey. So just thank you. Here's to you and Jan. Uh, thank you, Renell. And to you. Thank you, Dave. Mm -hmm. Salute, everyone. <laughs>